Okay, um, as Tim has said, my background is in vision. Uh, but getting into body images actually was my wife's fault. Um, we met when I was a grad student at Cambridge and she was doing her clinical training and she wrote a review of how do you measure body image. And I said, oh, that's done so badly. She said, well, you do better then. And I've been trying ever since. So, what is body image? Well, normally body image is broken down into two components. One is a, a perceptual component. That's how are you, how accurate are you at judging your own physical dimensions, your own size? And the other is what they call an attitudinal component, which is how do you feel about that body? You can maybe judge its size correctly, but you still feel it's fat. So initially I'm going to uh, focus on the perceptual sides, but I say we'll, we'll come back to the cognitive as we go along. Now, how to measure body image? Well, coming from a, a perception background, we decided to do, oh, goodness. <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> Coming from perception, <laughs> goodness. <laughs> what was in the tea? Um, what we started off with doing is something called a uh, two alternative forced choice experiment. Now, what someone would see on the, the computer screen is a fixation cross, then a body will appear. And then they're asked the question, is that body thinner or fatter than me? Uh, that response is recorded, then another fixation cross and another body. And the idea is, over time, over a number of different presentations, you can derive an estimate of what their body size is, or what they think their body size is. Okay? Uh, you can plot this data like this. Now, I should say, <laughs> oh dear, she does sound a bit unhappy, doesn't she? Um, if you do visual psychophysics, it's actually quite straightforward and simple. Uh, and try and hide that as you have lots of complicated words to describe what you do. And one of which is uh, point of subjective equality. And that's actually just the word given for your estimate of your body size. If you look at this here, where we've got, if you plot the data, which is just a probability of saying that body is fatter than me against the BMI of the body, you get this kind of function. Um, and you can see here, with very thin bodies, you're likely to say, pretty much, that's always going to be thinner than me. Or that body is always going to be fatter than me. But what you're interested in here is this part of the curve, where you're not so sure. And really, the point of subjective equality is where you're 50% likely to say it's bigger than me, or 50% likely to say it's smaller than me. So that's where you, we take it, your estimate of your body size. Obviously, different people will estimate different body sizes. So for subject A, they're estimating their body size as a BMI of around 25. BMI is your body size scale for height, body weight scale for height. Uh, person B, slightly lower, and so on. You can also derive one more thing. And it's another silly name, the difference lineman, which is really, this is just the gradient of this curve here. Now, if you have a very steep curve, that means you're actually very sensitive to change in body size. Okay, you can tell, okay, that body is much thinner than me. That body is much fatter than me, even if it's only a very small difference between your own body size. E alternatively, you may be less sensitive and the curve tends to be flatter. Okay? Now, just to re recap that, you can have results like this. Like percentage of probability of saying it's fatter than you against the BMI of the bodies you're judging. You can get this nice st steep curve here with the BMI quite low. Or you can get a much flatter curve, which suggests you're much poorer at discriminating between bodies. OK? Now, what do we get if we plot those estimates against the person's actual body size. Now this is just for 100 healthy controls. And this is the plot of their estimated body size, what they think they are, against their actual BMI. And if they're perfectly correct, 
they would follow that white line. Okay, they don't. And they show something which we call contraction bias. This is actually a very robust effect. We've done it lots of times. What contraction bias is, uh, it derives from how we actually make judgments about body size. We have an internal template reference based on all the bodies we've seen. Okay? And we say, how big or how small is that body relative to the one we have in our heads? Now, if it's very close in size to our internal reference, we're very good at it. But as the body we're making a judgment about gets further away in size, we tend to think it's more like the reference than it actually is, which means we tend to underestimate big bodies and overestimate thin bodies. Okay, so you can see people here who are, I'm afraid, on the BMI scale, tending to be overweight, are underestimating their size. Whereas people who are very thin, I hope you're all right, uh, tend to overestimate their size. And you can see this could be a potential reason for why people with anorexia who have very low body weight might overestimate their body size. And one of the problems you have with anorexia traditionally is that they do overestimate their body size. And this is one of the features that pushes their weight down. Okay? It's also a problem for people with the opposite problem, obesity. You tend to underestimate how big you are. So you're less likely to undertake health control, I mean, sort of dieting exercise. The other thing you notice here is the difference line, which is the difference, how sensitive you are. And sensitivity seems to get worse as the size of the bodies get bigger. Now, this is down to something called Weber's Law, one of my personal favorites, obviously. Um, this suggests that Weber's Law, uh, a fixed percentage is required for you to judge a size change. So let's say you need to detect visually that your body is getting bigger, you need about a 5% change, say. Now, if you're a very thin body, that actually only requires a small BMI change, a small number of absolute units to detect that change. But if you're actually very big, you actually need a lot of BMI units for you to detect that that 5% change has occurred. So in absolute terms, it gets progressively harder to detect a change in body mass. So, what does this mean? This means for control participants, you're really good at judging body size for bodies in the middle range. But you get your poor. If you had a thin body, you tend to overestimate. If you have a large body, you tend to underestimate. So, uh, we wanted, you can make, if we think this is a perceptual problem, uh, you can then say, well, okay, you should have it not just when you're judging your own body, you should have it for making judgments about other people's bodies too. And <laughs> these are uh, some bodies we did, pictures of bodies we took uh, years and years ago, my very first graduate student, Jo Emery, and she got heroically got, uh, got people into gray leotards and leggings. And if you make judgments about how big these bodies are like, you get this exactly the same thing. Even for other people's bodies, you're showing contraction bias. And you can also check for Weber's law. If you're doing a two alternative force choice experiment again, um, you're saying, which of these two bodies is bigger? See how small the difference in BMI has to be when you can for you to actually detect it. Whether you're using <coughs> the CGI artificial bodies that we use sometimes, or the real bodies, it's progressively harder to tell the difference. The absolute size of BMI units between the two gets, needs to be progressively larger, although the percentage difference remains the same. Okay, so that's all very well, but what actually happens with people who have anorexia? Uh, these are controls again, contraction bias. Uh, Faber's law, we might expect that 
are eating disorder participants will show a very similar effect. They would tend to uh, maybe slightly exaggerate it so they overestimate their body size for very thin bodies. Actually, very different response. They're most accurate at making judgments about very thin bodies. And as their weight goes up, because they're the people we're seeing are in receiving treatment and their weight is going up, so some of them are um, within the normal range, they start to progressively overestimate their body size. Now you can see this can be a, a significant problem if you're, trying, if you're in treatment and you don't like putting on weight. Not only do you detect that size change, you're, you're feeling actually it's much bigger than it actually is. The other thing is for Weber's law, the ability to discriminate very small changes in body size, uh, the anorexics show something we're calling uh, expertise effect. Because they're really interested in making discriminations between very, very thin bodies, they're much better at it than controls. So when you're trying to get their weight back up, they can detect those very small changes, and they really don't like it. It's also, you'll see that their ability doesn't extend over the whole BMI range. That's because how fat goes on and off the body isn't linear, so there are different cues at different parts of your BMI range. So, for example, if you're very thin, you may be looking for things like the saliency of bony landmarks, like uh, collarbones and so on. Whereas when you're heavier, it may be uh, fat deposition around the stomach. So, for our anorexic participants, they're actually very good at making judgments about very th thin bodies, which is what they're really interested in, but they get progressively overestimating as bodies move into the normal range and above. Uh, Another way of looking at this is um, eye movements. And what I want you to do now is find, amongst this scene of faces, find Tom Cruise's face. What you're seeing in the yellow dot is someone, we're tracking someone's eye movements. They're trying to find little Tom. Small but perfectly formed. Um, <laughs> actually, what you're doing is even more difficult than that. Because the structure of your eye means that only the very center of your fovea sees in detail. The rest is all blurred. And what you're doing when you're making any judgment like this is moving your eyes around, trying to move the area of high acuity over where Tom might be. So if you're interested in what cues someone's using to make a judgment, you can track their eye movement. See, where do they look? For how long and in what order? Uh, so we did an experiment uh, last year, maybe the year before, where we were trying to um, look to see whether the pattern of eye movements you make makes a difference about judgments. Uh, we had three observer groups. We had a group of recovering anorexics. We had a group of control observers who make the usual accurate judgments about their body size. And then we had an unusual group, a group of control observers who tended to overestimate their body size. If you screen 100, 200 uh, control observers, you'll find some who aren't so good at the task. And we specifically chose those. Now, because uh, these are recovering anorexics, their actual, their body weight is not significantly different from our other two groups. And we wanted this because they're making judgments about their own body size using the two alternative force paradigm. And we know that body size can influence the accuracy of your judgment. So we didn't want that. We wanted to take that out of the equation. So they all have the same body weight. And looking at their psychological scores, though, the control observers do not have significant pathology. But the anorexic group has significantly higher concerns about body size and shape based on these questionnaire results than the other two groups. So although their body weight is normal, successfully increased their body weight, their concerns about eating disorders has 
remained. And what you see is the difference between the estimate of their body size and their body mass index. The control group, accurate control group, is very good, pretty much spot on, but the other two groups are significantly overestimating their body size. So you wanted to see, well, could this be because they're looking in the wrong places? Um, <laughs> it's a rather disturbing picture, but um, one of the problems with using bodies, particularly real bodies, is um, how do you actually analyze the data? If you say, okay, we're going to show you 50 pictures uh, of different people's bodies, varying in their body mass, your relative proportions, your heights and so on, vary. And what people have tended to do is, okay, we're going to look at the number of fixations within a, on a particular feature of your body. And because you're compiling it across all these bodies, you have a big block called an area of interest, which you're going to count the number of fixations within that block. But because the, the bodies vary in size so much, it has to be a big block, which means you have very poor discrimination between groups because you can't say whether they're looking here or, or here because the area of interest is too big. So we came got around this problem by, firstly, ran the experiment, then we morphed all the bodies together to make a single morphed body. And then we applied the same uh, morph changes to their pattern of eye movements. So we brought them all into the same register. And then we can use very small areas of interest to make finer discriminations. And really what we're doing here is looking to see whether the number of fixations in block A, for example, is different from the number of fixations in block B, and so on. Now, what we tend to show it, when we're showing graphs and so on, in this more smoothed pattern. Uh, red, obviously, being more fixations down to sort of gray. Now, uh, this is a close-up. We've, we've cut out the rest of the body just for this, this presentation. Uh, again, red being the highest number of fixations going down. And what you can see is recovering anorexics, accurate controls, uh, overestimating controls. And they're superficially very, very similar. They're all looking largely on the torso. But you can see, you start to see some differences. The recovering anorexics have a far more distributed pattern of fixations, for example. But what's possibly more useful to look at this is looking at it not just the simple number of fixations, but the difference between the groups in where they're fixating. So here we've got the recovering anorexics, uh, the difference between the recovering anorexics and the accurate controls. And what you've got here is the blue is showing you where the accurate controls look more than the inaccurate anorexics. And accuracy tends to be linked very firmly to looking at the stomach, the lower stomach. Again, if you look at the difference between the uh, accurate controls and the inaccurate overestimating controls, the difference is really is where they're not looking so much here. It seems to be, to make an accurate judgment about body mass, you have to look here. We've done another experiment where we varied the angle uh, that someone sees a body. If you're looking at it front on, this is actually the hardest way of doing it. As the body rotates, the more you like to see it in profile at 45 degrees, you can see the size of the tummy, and it gets progressively easier. And you can uh, predict the accuracy of response based on the saliency of the tummy. So what we seem to see is our anorexic group are basically looking in the wrong places for the accurate information. Right, now I want to have a slight diversion, is talking about other factors that might influence your, about your body size. You, know, you seldom see bodies in isolation. Um, I'm sure we'll all go clubbing tonight, and we will see people relative to other people. We don't say, uh, um, I, you don't see them in absolute. And one of the problems with the visual system, it doesn't like absolute numbers, really. It likes to encode information as relative to something else. Now, 
This is something called the Ebbinghaus illusion. Uh, you may see, well, you know it's going to be a trick, but hopefully you'll see the central circles as being of different sizes. Yeah? You've got to work with me here, sort of to <laughs> nod and pretend. Um, I actually, I wrote a textbook a few years ago, and um, I looked to see whether other people were using this illusion, and, and most of them were. Um, but measuring their illusions, I found they'd actually cheated and <laughs> made the central circles different sizes. But I promise you, these ones are the same size. Now, the question is, if you're seeing bodies relative to other bodies, are you also going to be influenced by the size of the people around you? Uh, we did this a little, very slightly weird experiment where we were asking people to say which of these two bodies is the, the larger, the two central bodies. And the color there is fixation uh, from the eye movements to check that they were doing what we thought they were doing. And uh, what we're doing is the central bodies are the same size, same BMI category, same BMI value, in fact, but the flanking bodies are either much thinner or much larger. And what our results show was you would judge the central body as being thinner if the bodies surrounding it were larger. And you would judge that central body as being larger if the bodies around it were thinner, which I think brings home the vital importance of choosing your friends with care. <laughs> now, <coughs> we're very, as someone who works a bit with, e with, with eating disorders and body image, we're very interested in what's a normal ideal body size. Normal, we're saying, with a control population without clinical pathology. And how does it change? Can we change? Because one of our problems with the working with anorexic and bulimic groups is they want their ideal is much thinner. So we wanted to see to what extent our perception is flexible. Now, this is a very, an old result uh, where we're plotting. We ask people to rate the attractiveness of 50 bodies varying in their body mass index. And each of these uh, little circles represents the average rating for a particular body. The red line, a fitted curve, the green line, the confidence limits. And what you can see there, which will be work better like this, is uh, as the BMI changes, the attractiveness rating of the body changes. Probably what you'd expect with a peak at around 1920, which is the, much, the lower end of the normal BMI range, is regarded as most attractive. And being thinner than that, or being heavier than that, you change, you become less attractive. Now, <coughs> we were interested to see whether this was a, a common phenomenon, and it is pretty robust. Um, we looked throughout Europe, we looked in America, North America, and you can replicate this result, and you can replicate it in different age groups, different genders. Everybody says, for female body size, this is the relationship you've got. Uh, coming from an evolutionary psychology background as well, I have lots of bad influences, um, this didn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, some evolutionary psychologists would say, yes, it does, because what you find attractive is something that's hardwired into your visual system. You are here because your ancestors were good at choosing someone who's healthy and fertile. And the features which predict health and fertility are going to be the same wherever you go. So everyone should have the same idea, the same ideal. Um, same ideal body size, the same ideal body shape. Now, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if health and fertility, because most evolutionary psychologists would say that attractiveness is just a certificate of health and fertility. It just tells you, in an unconscious way, who's the right potential partner. 
But as environments change, an environment, for example, where there's a lot of food, like here, or an environment where there's not much food, the ideal body size and shape should also change. And if we say that something like attractiveness is evolutionarily selected for, then it should be adaptive, it should be changeable. So, we did a little experiment where we looked at the perceptions of attractive body size in UK versus um, a group of people from KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Uh, we had uh, both African and uh, uh, Europeans, and they were rating a set of 50 bodies for attractiveness and health. Interestingly, what they thought was attractive is also what they thought was healthy. They were exactly the same. And we had four groups. We had Europeans who were born in South Africa, but they had been born and brought up in the UK. Uh, people from KwaZulu-Natal who had moved to the UK within the last 18 months. And people who were still in KwaZulu-Natal, born and brought up there. We were interested to see whether there would be any difference in their ideals. Well, this is our European participants, and they show exactly the same result as we found wherever. Um, they, it's incredibly disappointing when you always find the same thing. Uh, it's going to go into a low-impact paper. It's, it's very disappointing. Um, so we were hopeful we might get something. And what we got was something very different indeed. Um, what we've got here is... The attractive rating again, the BMI of the bodies, each of these points rec represents an average rating for a particular body. And whereas for our European, or basically our people from the UK, there's a steep decline as weight increases beyond a certain point, about 1920, for our African participants living in KwaZulu-Natal, there's no drop. The peak is much higher BMI, around 26, which is in the overweight range. And there's not this flattening out of the curve at high BMI levels. So this isn't necessarily a problem for your more fundamentalist evolutionary psychologists, because they can say, well, OK, different populations living in different environments over generations, their preferences have been selected to be different. So if you're a European, you come up in one particular environment, your ancestors have been in that particular environment, your preferences should be for what works best in Europe. If you're African, what works best in Africa. And there's no surprise they might be different. But if you look at our people, the people who've moved from KwaZulu-Natal to the UK, what we're getting is this part of the curve has dropped is moving towards what you would expect from our European participants. And if you look at people from South Africa who've born and brought up in the UK, their results are no different from our European people born and brought up in the UK. It's not genetic. It's not hardwired. It's a flexible representation that changes as your environment changes. And that means that our unrealistic representation, our unrealistic belief in body size can change. Now, we were interested in what predicts these changes. Um, and to do this, we carried out a number of experiments, uh, one of which was <laughs> we thought, OK, what's the difference between someone living in the UK where there's lots of food, uh, lots of medicine, and so on, and someone living in a more challenging environment. Uh, the region of KwaZulu and the we were recruiting from had uh, the people there reported that they had gone through periods of famine, of low, not being going hungry, didn't have food, it was a much stressful environment. So we thought, let's look to see what happens if you are hungry. So we asked volunteers, and they missed a couple of meals. 
and we looked at how their, their results changed. And if you look here, an attractiveness rating against the BMI of the body said judging, the black ones here are the ratings of the people who weren't hungry, and the white dots here are the people who were hungry. Even missing a couple of meals shifts your ideal towards a heavier body. So there is a physiological reason for this potential shift. You can get the same effect with stress. We took a, a cohort of uh, people with stress, and we wanted to stress them. So what was the most stressful thing we could think of? Well, we made them give a public lecture. <laughs> We measured their stress levels before and after giving a 15-minute talk. And the very stressed people showed exactly the same movement out to a, a higher BMI peak. So that's causing some changes, but not a lot of changes, really, not compared to what we were getting from KwaZulu and Natal. So just it's some physiological effects. But what else could be? What else could be? Um, altering people's perceptions. What else could be influencing them? Um, well, I'm sure uh, a lot of people say, well, the media, the media is, is, is doing it. We know that because it's in your lecture title. <laughs> but it's actually quite difficult to do uh, media experiments because we all see it all the time. You've got your smartphones, your tablets, your laptops, your televisions, you see the thin bodies. Everybody has such media exposure. Uh, if you give them a little bit more, it's kind of, you're pretty much at ceiling of ceiling. And any effect is going to be quite small and quite transient. We really needed to go somewhere where people weren't seeing the media. So uh, we decided to go to the Caribbean. <laughs> As you do. Um, Nicaragua, lovely place. Uh, and it's even lovelier if you can go and don't have to pay for it yourself and get leave a human trust to do so. Um, why this is an important place to go to for your holidays is because there are villages with no electricity and no t no, therefore no TV access. There are villages with limited electricity. They might have a, a solar panel or a generator. Now, most of the electricity they need for more important things like a refrigerator, for cooking, and so on, but they will allow a certain length of time, maybe a couple of hours a day, maybe less, for TV. And you have villages with, who are on the national grid, they have full TV access. And what makes it really fun is that the government is rolling out electricity to the villages who currently have no electricity. And they're getting TVs and all the benefits of um, a TV environment and telenovelas. So you can look to see what happens to their judgments about body size and body attractiveness as the media rolls in. Now, we can therefore have two designs for looking at body image in Nicaragua. We can look cross-sectionally at villages with different levels of media access. And we can look longitudinally at the same village and then tracking how the introduction of TV changes or doesn't change media preferences versus a village that hasn't had any change in its TV access. Um, when we were looking at three groups, uh, adult women, their perception of their actual and ideal body size, adult men, their perception of women's bodies and their ideal partner, because this does have, there is a social pressure to conform to a specific ideal, and we were interested in how their ideal changed and what effect it would have on. And most interesting, we're interested in adolescent children, their perception of their actual and ideal body, because we suspect they will probably be the most sensitive to the introduction of TV. Um, these, this study is ongoing. Um, Tracy has finished her PhD now, but we have some Levy Hume money to keep her going, and she's actually employed here now in Lincoln. 
although she mentioned the fact that she can't get away from having a river running through where she works. Yeah. Um, but this is the first piece of data which we've just published. Uh, and we've got, this is a cross-sectional study, Managua, high levels of TV, uh, square point, no TV, and Kakabina, uh, limited TV. Uh, if we look at what's going on in Managua, they show exactly the same pattern of response as you would get from a European observer. If we asked you all to rate the same set of bodies, you'd show exactly the same pattern. But if you then go to the village that doesn't have TV, they show a very different pattern. They show something more like we have in KwaZulu-Natal. And if we look at the village that has a bit of TV, the more TV exposure you get, the thinner your body ideal and the less you like a heavier body. And we're also looking at things like uh, TV content, exactly what they're watching. But that's still being analyzed. So, what I would try and tell you at this stage is we do think that the media has an incredible influence on what you regard as an ideal body size. But it is a flexible representation and you can change it. Changing the media will change what you think is a, an ideal body size, what you should be aspiring to. We have in the UK the problem of increasingly thin pictures in the magazines and on TV while we're getting increasingly heavy. And there's something called body image disturbance, the difference between what you are and what you want to be. And that difference is, is getting bigger. Now, what we're going to be doing here in Lincoln is, as Tim was alluding to, we've got lots of new exciting projects. We've got a 3D scanner, so instead of looking at pictures of other people, we can take scan you as a 3D picture, and then you can see yourself, and we can adjust your size and shape. And you can do that now. One of the things we're doing is in virtual reality, what it's like to inhabit a body of a particular size. And you can change the apparent size of your, the body you're in. We're also doing something. Um, with movement. <laughs> what we wanted to do was, everyone says, well, you're using static images. That, it's not what you really see. People move around. And I say, inconveniently, that is true. <laughs> so what you can do is motion capture something. You get people in, you get volunteers in, you ask them, OK, we put on the motion capture kit, dance or move or whatever. Uh, and then we take a standard body and we use that pattern of motion to animate it. So instead of having the problem of having the same, the body looks, if you're trying to ask, is that an attractive dance? Isn't it an attractive dance? You have the problem of different people's bodies having different levels of attractiveness as well as the dance, which contaminates the results. But by using a standard body, you can get around that. And if you do that, um, I can tell you what you should be doing clubbing. Other than choosing very big friends, you should also be uh, the lowest rated dancer here, the highest rated dancer here. Uh, two things. Firstly, I'm not going to demonstrate because it would be strange and disturbing. Um, <laughs> But you need to move the torso. The more you move the torso, that's regarded as more attractive. Unattractive dancers don't. They just do what guys do. Um, the other thing is movement of the arms. If you can move your arms in a dance move and you're moving them independently, that's regarded as attractive. And what we think that is, is a demonstration that you have actually quite good motor control. If you move them independently too much, to lose control, that's unattractive. But the controlled movement of your arms, moving the body around, you'll do well. 
So, just, I hope you've enjoyed this. If not, it's all been a bad dream. <laughs> <laughs>